Hello and welcome to CMC Markets and the um, this this non-farm payrolls webinar on Friday the 4th of November and uh, this webinar will be hosted by myself Michael Hewson and my colleague in Canada Colin Sizinski before we get started Good morning, everyone before we get started with just a few housekeeping rules we've got a risk warning which we have to display at the beginning of every one of these presentations because ultimately what Colin and I are discussing it's not just it, it's not about trading advice it's it's really about trying to interpret how the data might move various markets and um, what effect as well I think the US presidential election is likely to have and whether or not it will overshadow um, today's payrolls number and I think we can both agree uh, Mr. Szynski that ultimately it's not really about today's payrolls numbers it's about um, the US election because I think Absolutely. You know, and, please, and please correct me if I'm wrong here ultimately unless we get a big miss on payrolls I don't think it's going to move the dial at all I agree. I think what we're looking at here is uh, is we're less than a week before the election. Both parties are going to try and take whatever number comes out and spin it to their advantage, whichever way they can. The the number that came out last month, the uh, just above 150, Trump went around for a week saying it was terrible and awful and and we need change big time and of course any any good number the democrats are going to go around saying well obama's economic policies are working we were working and we want four more years of the same so it's uh, it's really uh, whatever happens is going to be spun more in relation to the election uh, than to the fed and and my feeling is going into this that uh, you you to have a real surprise to move the market you i said below 50 or above 250 uh, otherwise nobody will really notice and, and certainly not the uh, the fed the fed's still on course for a December rate hike and even that's more likely to be influenced by the election and market volatility than any economic data we get between now and then we're really into a much more political phase in the market so uh, what I've said uh, in, uh, in my non-firm guesses this morning is I put a 140 it's a little bit below street my feeling is that because you've got such a polarized difference between the two parties and, and such a potential for a radical shift in direction that a lot of companies have probably in October put off their their decision making a little bit and well we'll just hold off on hiring until after the election so that's my feeling is you'll probably get more likely all else being equal a a, a slightly disappointing uh, result or a slightly little bit down from last month. Yeah, I would, I would tend to agree with that. I mean, if we look at the um, world interest rate probability um, assessment for December, uh, markets are pricing in a 76% probability of a hike uh, next month. Um, now, obviously, we have today's payrolls data. We also have the November numbers, which would due, be due out. I think on the 2nd of December. So we've got, two, so. We've got two payrolls numbers between now and the um, December meeting, which I think is 14th of December, 14th and the 15th or the 13th of the 14th. It's round about that sort of time anyway. So I think in the context of what's going to move the markets today, I think it's going to be a dollar move. I think if there's a big miss on, on non-farms towards the downside and I think that's my bias I think a poor number could actually be dollar negative and could push cable through 125 um, it's a big big level cable 125 this is the gap it's the flash crash gap between 125 and 126 and ultimately that hasn't really been filled yet and I really want to see that filled so in the context of what we're expecting today First and foremost, we are finding a little bit of resistance around about this 125 area. I think if we go 10 bid or something like that, I think we could see a very quick 100 point move up to around about 126, 12550 even. But more, you know, more than that, I'm thinking we've really we've come a long way this week on the pound, and ultimately um, we are now looking to start to run into I think a little bit of resistance at these sorts of levels, but then you've got to flip that on its head and say, well, actually, the market is so short of sterling that any move, I think if, if, if any currency is going to move today on the back of these numbers, it's probably going to be sterling. Um, so what are we expecting? Yes, I think that's reasonable. The other one, Michael, is to watch for is dollar yen, which is the other one that's had a really big move this week, dropping from 105 to uh, 
to 103 against the U.S. dollar. That's the uh, and that was on defensive flows related to the election. It's the election. Gold took off last week, and the yen took off this week. Mm. Yeah, so let's look at let, well, let's look at the key levels in dollar yen because let's let's first and foremost look at what we're expecting because I think this is really about the direction of travel and at the direct the direction of travel at the moment for the dollar is down. I think we can pretty much say that with with a certain degree of confidence. And certainly yeah, it's the, totally rolled over here. And certainly in the context, for me, I think this is really a case of selling the rally on any dollar strength rather than anything else for me because of the change that we've seen in sentiment over the past few days. And it's not likely to change that much between now and Tuesday because ultimately I think presidential election dictates everything here. Unless we get a very big beat above 200,000 on the payrolls data on the upside, or a big miss on the downside, say for example 105, 110 perhaps, maybe even less than 100. Mm. I'm more inclined to think that we're probably going to get a miss because of the weak ISM employment components on the non-manufacturing that we saw out earlier this week and on the manufacturing as well. Both of those components were weak. Now there isn't necessarily a correlation between the two and we've talked about correlations between payrolls and um, ADP for quite some time. Now this chart is probably not as elegant as your one, Colin. Ignore the green line. Okay, the green line is basically payrolls this time last year. You've got the blue line here, which is ADP and runs from right to left, and you've got the um, red line, which is non-farm payrolls. And you can see they're matching each other quite nicely on this particular number and ADP here actually has ratcheted lower on from the previous month even though we did get a very big upward revision to last month's to 202 so that would suggest to me that potentially we could get another downward leg in non-farm payrolls given the way that these have matched quite closely in the past six months now I know you were going to talk a little bit more about that Colin did you want to add anything else <coughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to note overall what, what's important to look at here I found also is this channel between, uh, for the most part, between about 150 and 250 and that's fairly consistent. So if you get a result in that range, it's going to be fairly... Um, in fairly neutral. I mean, people would people would kind of it wouldn't surprise too many people, especially the more recently between say uh, 140 and 200 isn't going to uh, get anybody uh, overly excited. Uh, however, I do want to note something that was that was quite intriguing that happened back in the spring, just before the um, the Brexit vote in uh, in June. We got the May payrolls at the beginning of June, and at the time the uh, there had been some question of what would, would the Fed not raise it. The Fed was supposed to raise interest rates in June, but the Brexit vote was coming, and there were some some questions as to uh, whether the Fed would try and uh, hold off and blame it on Brexit. And and at the time, I had wrote an an entertaining article about that. If the uh, if the Fed blamed it on blamed a, a no move on Brexit, they'd be throwing away. 240 years of U.S. independence, and it got some pickup in the media, and nice articles with pictures of George Washington, and uh, and we all had a good laugh about it in May, and then uh, and then the first week of June, we got this incredibly disastrous non-farm payrolls number, which coincidentally gave the Fed cover to to blame non-farm payrolls instead of Brexit for not raising rates in June, and then miraculously, the first week in July after the Brexit vote, the U.S. put up the most spectacular non-farm payrolls number we had seen in a long time it was absolutely hilarious so if if we think there's any political uh inference at all going on here that the uh, a low number favors trump and favors the republicans a, a high number favors clinton and, and the democrats but uh, but who knows what's going to happen but i still think really all else being equal michael and i are still on track for the uh, somewhere in between 100 and 150 i think is what we're really looking at but if we get a out of left field number it would suggest there's some political uh, wrangling going on as well so what you're basically saying colin is that you think that it's going to be a big beat to the top side um, because Hillary Clinton sort of had a little whisper in the BLS's ear saying, can you give me a decent payrolls number? It doesn't matter if you revise it away subsequently. Um, you, if we get a big B, that's what I'll be thinking. <laughs> that's what I'll be thinking. <laughs> so, so, so you're into conspiracy theories. Especially theory. although... <laughs> I, you know, I just wonder after what we saw back in the spring, it was kind of... Uh, that one I found shocking because that's like... 
that one just blew me away when that happened. So <laughs> let's see what happens. But if we do, there's our surprise, and that's my out of left field conspiracy guess. But my my real guess is it's still the 140. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the thing is, the, the problem with that is that that, um, that low figure wasn't revised away, whereas the ADP number for that month, May, um, was 168. It ended up being revised downward. Yeah, it was 168, yeah. and then got revised down to 24. So, you know, I mean, you know, I suppose it's, 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 it swings and roundabouts. But for the sake of this, I mean, I'm looking at this Ichimoku cloud chart here, and we've mm -hmm. now broken below the, we've broken back into the cloud after being above it. And break and not being able to take out this trend line. Now I would suggest here, if we look at the resistance levels on this particular chart here, the cloud resistance on the top side is about 103.30. So I think if we get a good number on non-farms, slightly dollar positives, then I think the upside is probably going to be limited to about 103.30, 103.40, which suggests sounds that, reasonable. Which which would then suggest that any pullback after that if it fails to get back through there then we're going to come back down here and touch the bottom of that cloud which is around 101 95 102 so now that we're back in the cloud and we've closed back in the cloud the way this has worked over the course of the past it's worked fairly well as support or resistance i would suggest a slightly positive dollar number will push the dollar higher so we're talking anything in the region of 180 190 maybe 200 we'll get a bit of dollar buying. I think that will be an opportunity to sell dollar strength, to sell dollar rebound for a move back lower in the short to medium term. And I think this, it's a similar sort of story for euro dollar as well. If we look at euro dollar here, we're running into a significant amount of resistance around about 111.30, 111.40. So again, um, you know, a strong dollar number here um, could potentially knock euro dollar back down. Um, on on the subject of the S and P, let's have a quick look at that before, because we've got a two minute, two and a half minute countdown. We are right on the 200 day moving average right now, um, so that yeah. would suggest to me that there's certainly a significant potential, f a little bit of buying interest between 2080 and 2085. Um, so again, I think we could see a little bit of a pullback to pot potentially 2100. That's really borne out. And that's by also a beautiful. Go on. Rounded top and descending yeah. triangle that but, is but, but, broken but, but, there. But, but, and the Dow is the same thing. There's the Dow. I mean, the Dow is on a very solid support there. And also, it's also not too far away from the moving average. So, again, I think there's potential for a little bit of a stock market rebound. Whatever these numbers are, they may try and push through the lows. I would be surprised. That's not to say it won't happen, but I would be surprised if we push significantly lower than we already have done this week on the back of these numbers. Um, looking again at the FTSE 100 very quickly, again we're right on trendline support from those August lows where I've linked them through there. We've gone slightly through it, but again around about the 6,670 area does appear to be some element of support and then you've got the September lows through there. So, you know, my bias at the moment is that the market does appear to be a little bit overextended on the downside and we can sort of see it borne out an awful lot on an awful lot of these 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 charts here as well around about 10,200 on the DAX. Now, as for gold, where are we on yeah. gold? Well, we're above 1300. Oh, one quick thing. Go on. I was also just going to quickly note the uh, we're starting to see some oversold readings show up on particularly on on the FTSE. So it is uh, you're right. We are kind of getting to a bit of a downside extreme. We might get a bit of a trading bounce even if the primary trends continue. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead on gold. Uh, gold. I was going to say that it does look a little bit toppy at these sorts of levels. So again, that really does support the idea of potentially a a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a top, a little bit of a sell off. Maybe back to around 1290. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be surprised to see it go back to 1280. But around about 1310, there is a significant amount of resistance. So to sum this up, as we head in, this this is what we're expecting. The forecasts here: 175 non-farms, um, 4.9 on the unemployment, and average earnings. If we have a decent average earnings number in excess of 2.6%, again that will be dollar positive. So keep an eye on that, and we're ready yeah. to go right now. Okay, there we go. 140... 161. 161. Right down the middle. 191. Yeah, a little bit below one. street. Upward revision. Yeah, upward revision. 4.9 on the... 
unemployment rate, which is as expected. Two point eight on average earnings. Two point eight on the hourly earnings. That's, yeah, that's huge. That's huge. So that's dollar positive. That's the inflation pressures are growing. Yeah. So that's yeah. going to push. That's going to push the dollar up, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Dollar yen's going up around one hundred three ten. Um, cable back around one twenty four eighty. Euro dollar below 111 but it's 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 fairly subdued but i think we'll see the dollar push higher a little bit uh, as we as we head into the rest of the day on the back of these numbers slightly a dollar positive yes. bias to them canadian payrolls report do you want to fill that in colin huge huge 43.9 thousand increase increase the street was expecting a 15,000 decrease. The uh, full-time employment was a decline of 23,000. There was a reversal of last month we got, but it's, so it's a huge increase in part-time employment to the tune of 67,000. So uh, normally we would like to see, obviously, the, uh, the, that be reversed in the big increase in full-time over part-time, but, but beggars can't be choosers at this point in time. Canada's been struggling, and, uh, and so overall this is a pretty decent print for, uh, for Canada. I mean, to be quite honest, they're pretty decent. Help the loony. Yeah, they're pretty. I mean, that's the that's the five minute chart of dollar cad at the moment. It, it's spiked lower, but it's pretty much back where yeah. it was. There, there's been virtually no reaction to it whatsoever in terms of where it was in the lead up to the numbers, which surprises me a little bit. You'd think that um, we'd 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 head you'd lower. You'd think you'd get a bit of an improvement. Yeah, you would. I mean, we did have. Yeah, the street usually discounts part time a little bit. They do mm. focus a little bit more on the full time. Uh, full-time job creation but every little bit helps at least it's not going down i see now as we're just looking on the minute chart here here mm. it's gone down it's gone back up and it's kind of, kind of flat to slightly lower mm. but the other thing you've got with dollar cad is you've got the you always look at the canadian data but then you've got what's happening with the oil price and what's happening with the u.s dollars so there's always a number of factors driving dollar cad at any given time yeah um, but going, going back to the non-farm payrolls, we got an upward revision to September from 156 to 191 um, and 161 instead of the 173. So it's sort of like a good news, bad news. It's basically a decent number. It's not going to derail a Fed rate rise. And more importantly, the jump in average earnings to 2.8% from 2.7% revision to September from 26 supports the idea that we are going to get a US rate rise in December, mm -hmm. Mr. Trump notwithstanding. And Mr. Trump remains the wild card here and will continue to be so. And ultimately, there is only one thing in my view that will derail a Fed rate rise. And it's not economic data. It's Mr. Trump being elected president of the United States, because ultimately no one will really know much before his inauguration in January what sort of president he will be and that is the big unknown but to add to that michael the uh, even if we do i think it, what we'd be looking at is that you'd probably see market volatility on a trump win because people as michael mentioned people aren't going to know what he's going to do however the one thing that would be clear is that a rate hike would be delayed, not not put off indefinitely, because uh, Mr. Trump has been going around for the last several months, uh, basically putting pressure on the Fed to raise rates and saying that they've been keeping interest rates artificially low to help the Democrats. So odds are, if you didn't see one in December, you could still see one go in. Uh, probably in March would be my guess, if uh, if you did get a delay, because I think he'd be he'd be in there trying to talk the Fed into starting to get raise interest rates anyways but it's uh, there'd be a lot of volatility at first just because people don't know what he's going to do well assuming of course that possibly Janet, including himself <laughs> assuming that janet yellen survives that's another thing chief. and leo brainerd for that matter yeah exactly. well either way on leo brainerd because if she gets uh, if clinton gets elected uh, brainerd's been is on the it seems to be on the uh, the the media short list for uh, treasury secretary yeah, absolutely. But only if Clinton gets in, obviously. <laughs> only if Clinton gets in. Yeah. If if Trump gets in, then her uh, her influence diminishes dramatically. Well, I think it. I think it diminish. I think her influence diminish, diminishes completely. Um, because yeah, I, exactly. I, I, don't th I don't think. I don't think she'd be acceptable because there is a certain amount of political influence on um, on any fe new Fed members because ultimately they have to be um, ratified by the president, do they not? Uh, yes, and ratified by Congress, so yeah. that the, the uh, they get nominated, and then they have to go through an approval process for Congress, just like uh, members of cabinet do. Yeah, 
Okay, so um, and assuming that Hillary Clinton becomes elected or gets elected, then you still have uncertainty because of the FBI investigation into her um, her her, um, her emails, emails that so, showed up on uh, Anthony Weiner's computer. Exactly. So you know the, the problem. You've then got the uncertainty that you could have a situation whereby you've got a president in waiting who's under investigation by the FBI and ultimately it's unlikely that that particular probe will be resolved anytime soon so you'll still have a huge Little amount of uncertainty now whether that will affect the economic outlook I don't think that it will certainly not if Clinton wins because I think in terms of Fed policy the status quo will be maintained um, but ultimately it won't be good uh go on yeah, no, it won't be good politically, and it could impact the mood of the country. Although her um, her vice presidential candidate Tim Kaine was also fairly well respected, so it's not a uh, it's not a complete washout if she gets into trouble. And I mean, there were other people. There's been a lot of other people hanging around in the background. So, and I think that's probably more important than anything else. I think really the important fa thing to factor in with respect to the election is the makeup of the two houses the Senate and Congress. Um, if the status quo is maintained there, then ultimately there's not an awful lot of damage Mr. Trump can do, because ultimately he can be reined in by the Republicans in uh, the House where they have a majority. Um, mm -hmm. But the damage to potential foreign policy could be quite significant, and I think that's where the risks are. I think it's in terms of n not so much domestic po policy, it's more foreign policy. Um, just been asked about pa paralysis if Clinton gets in. I don't think so because America's bigger than one person. Ultimately, if if Clinton finally finds she has to step down, then I think Tim Kaine will probably have to step in. Um, and personally, while I don't know an awful lot about him, that may actually be a good thing. Colin may have. Yeah, he was uh, governor of Virginia, I believe it was, or senator. But he, and I think at one point he was governor. So he's somebody who does have a lot of political experience. Is very well known around uh, around Washington. As I so what I, I gather I, from what I can tell from past reading, he's re he's pretty well respected uh, all around. So uh, so it wouldn't be a uh, a huge issue. Now, well, the one thing you probably will run into is because Trump has ended up doing a lot better than uh, than everybody thought. Even if Clinton wins the presidency, you're looking at a gridlock Congress because they, the Democrats might manage to, one party or the other is going to just squeak out control of the Senate, but it does look like the Republicans are going to pretty solidly control, uh, take control of the, uh, or sorry, maintain control of the House. The, the Democrats stopped talking about trying to retake the House months ago. They kind of gave up on that. It just, it's not going their way. They were hoping for the Senate, but you don't have this 20-point Clinton blowout that, that would be enough to carry down the ticket and so uh, so that's what you're probably looking at here okay, okay. as well so they so you I mean regardless of whether she wins or not and regardless of the investigations uh, or not if she wins you're going to have gridlock between the Democrats and the Republicans which is pretty much the same as you've had for the last two years with Obama so no change there yeah um, yeah. Right, so let's move on. Um, let's have a look at crude oil in the wake of that headline from that for, over the wires from Saudi Arabia that in the event that they can't reach an agreement with Iran about um, a production freeze or what have you, then they will s turn the taps back on again. Ultimately, I think it's unlikely that Iran will agree to be capped at 4 million barrels a day or less than 4 million barrels a day. In Back in March this year, they said that their goal was to get production capacity back to the levels that they 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 had prior to economic sanctions being implemented that was four million barrels per day um, and in excess of that so I can't see Iran rowing back from that which ultimately means that we could well see um, peak 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 oil supply for quite some time longer than originally has been priced in and it's certainly being borne out by what's happening in this chart here on Brent. We've broken the uptrend line from the lows that we saw in January this year. God, that seems a long time ago now. Uh, but here we are, we're almost, we're almost, we're almost in, at Christmas, not too far away. That's only about six or seven weeks away. So we're looking at a very, very key support on Brent around about the levels that we are now, around about $44.80. 
if we look at a similar chart on WTI, we have a similar sort of uh, scenario playing out here with respect to that. The 200 day moving average, it's going to be fairly important in the context of the overall move. And while we did actually briefly dip below it in July, August this year, we weren't able to sustain a move below it. What I would want to see from both of these contracts is a confirmed move of both contracts lower to confirm a move back to towards $40 a barrel on WTI because ultimately I think that's potentially where we're going and I think dollar CAD is probably being driven more by um, the negative news from the, the Saudis than the, employment. than the employment report which uh, my colleague Jesper has just tweeted um, and subsequently deleted. Nice one, mate. I'll uh, retweet that one uh, when you when you <laughs> send when you send it again. You you're adding <laughs> Canadian. Can I mention on? Yeah, sure. Oh, I was just going to add to uh, add to that. If you look on the WTI chart and and on the Brent chart for that matter, oh, on the uh, stochastics, up. it's starting to get about as over as oversold as we were back in July. So these t these 200 day tests are particularly significant. You could see them hold here. The other thing to note is we're in kind of a 40 to 50 channel mm -hmm. for WTI. It, it doesn't go much. I mean, except for the big. A bump we had back down in the winter but it hasn't really gone down below 40 and stayed below 40 since we retook it back in the spring and, and the reason for that is because between below once you get below 40 not very many people are making, people are making money anymore and the problem was once you get above 50 then that starts to bring the uh, US uh, shale production that's been shut in back on stream because that then becomes economic so you're sitting you're sitting also in, in around in and around 45 right in the middle of this range but this 40 to 50 range seems to be the sweet spot for uh, for WTI, and that's why we've seen it trending sideways since June. All right, we've got a Fed policymaker commenting on the wires at the moment. Fed's Lockhart says Fed close to achieving its policy goals. Fed's Lockhart says economy approaching full employment. Lockhart, inflation low and stable, just a bit below Fed goal. Um, economy doesn't call for pre programmed tightening. So basically, he's saying he's, the Fed's still on course for a December rate rise on the basis of that employment report. Um, I'm being asked on my views for the Japan 225, so I'm going to go and talk about that. Um, essentially, that's a proxy on what the dollar yen is doing at the moment, and certainly in the, on the basis of this weekly chart, I think there's potential for downside on dollar yen. Let's look at this. We've got a potential bearish candle going on here on the weekly chart. The likelihood is that we're probably going to see further declines on the Nikkei. Um, towards these series of lows in October. Let's quickly just draw a little bit, do a little bit of analysis on this. Let's draw a trend line through there. We're right on this trend line support from the June lows. Um, certainly on the basis of the daily, on, on the weekly chart, we're on the, we're on the cusp of a potential bearish reversal. So I certainly think in the context of the, what the dollar yen could potentially do, this Nikkei reversal is potentially quite bearish and actually a strong yen is the last thing that the Nik the, the Nikkei needs and if this is a poor, if this is a an indicator of what the dollar yen could do then potentially we could head back towards 101 on dollar yen over the course of the next few days um, if this bearish reversal is confirmed i mean it's not by no means it's it's by no means you know a, a nailed on indicator but certainly on the basis of this particular chart here on the weekly chart, there does appear to be a real difficulty in actually breaking out of this range, breaking out of the highs that we've seen over the course of the past few few months and actually heading towards um, a test of support and maybe these mid-October lows that we saw um, a few weeks ago. So ultimately, I think the Nikkei 225, we've declined four days in a row. We could see a bit of a pullback towards 17,100 in these sort of peaks here, but ultimately momentum does appear to have shifted on the Nikkei and we could actually head back towards 16,700, 16,600. Yes, and that's tracking the uh, the rally in the uh, in the yen as the yen yeah. recovers. We're seeing the uh, the Japanese roll over, and certainly we've been seeing the FTSE roll over with the pound bouncing back, and and I think that's something we want to consider as we head into the election result. Is that um, you may what we had with Brexit, and when we had the Brexit surprise, 
was that we had this big, very short-term drop in the FTSE, but we also at the same time had the collapse in the pound. And, and, and then, so the FTSE went down for a very short period of time, and then it started to go back up. And when we go to the, head to the election next week, we also want to keep that variation between and, and, and mirror action between the currency and the stock market uh, in mind, because it's the same sort of thing in the U.S. You'll probably see if Trump wins, the dollar get hit pretty hard. And, and that could, and probably an initial decline in the uh, in the U.S. indices, and certainly we've seen them under distribution. But if if you get a big enough drop in the dollar, then the indices may actually start to go up. So you may have a two stage reaction in the uh, in the stock market. Should uh, should Mr. Trump win? Should uh, Clinton win? You're probably looking at the dollar stay up and stock markets and stock markets go back up because they've been coming down lately. Indeed. I mean, one thing I would say about the Brexit vote is we saw the pound actually going up in the lead up to the vote. That's not been mm -hmm. happening. That's not been happening with respect to the dollar. The dollar has been sinking ahead of the vote. So there is a slightly different narrative going on here with respect to the dollar than there was relative yes. to the pound. And what's interesting is this has shifted in the last week or so because I, I, up until about 10 days ago, the dollar was going up and gold was going down and we had that reversal last week. And I, I think what's happening this time is that because traders got caught so offside by Brexit and they were, they were so wrong and so far out on a limb that I think this time you're seeing people take a bit more of a conservative approach and, uh, and that we have actually, as Trump has gained momentum in the polls in the last week and a half, we've seen the markets actually starting to, to reflect that a little bit. Not everybody's uh, willing to, to get caught, uh, caught surprised. Uh, again, it's that, that fool me once, shame on, on you, fool me twice, shame on me. And so I think a lot of people are, uh, are, are take, have taken that, and that's why we're seeing some of the action we're seeing in the U.S. markets. There is just a little bit of, of uh, pricing in going on for the, the, the uh, growing potential of, potential of either a very close race, a, a contested election, or, uh, or a Trump win. And just to note to people, when we had the contested election in 2000, the market went down 5% in November. So uh, keep an eye on that as well. That was a, It wasn't a bear market, but the contested election was, uh, people t t took to that as, a, as blaming for the, uh, the bear market that ensued. Okay, so um, I think our half hour is up. Um, does anyone have any other questions that they'd like to direct at myself and Colin? Um, well, wait, I'll, I'll give you, give you a few seconds to type a... Do we have this one here for the next OPEC meeting? Yes, I've Which just... Which is, I've just, uh, I've just November 30th, sorry. Yes, I've yeah. just replied to that. I've just replied to that. Did you see that? 30th, yes. 30th of November is the next OPEC meeting in Vienna. Do you have any more there, Colin? No, that's all I can see on here. Okay. All right, well... Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we'll be doing another one of these on the December, the November payrolls numbers on the 2nd of December. Don't forget we do a regular Monday um, afternoon webinar at 12.15, which my colleague Jesper Lawler um, hosts. And um, that, that's always very, very informative. You can go to the education section to sign up for that. Otherwise, Colin and myself would like to thank you for turning up today and hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you all very much.